Okay, let's uh, we'll take a few moments. Uh, make sure we're in fellowship. First uh, John one nine. We confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We'll take a few moments. Uh, each of you can prepare in your own hearts and minds to um, put in gear, I guess, uh, your mind uh, on what we're about to do, and that is look into the Word and see what it says and uh, what does it mean. So take a few moments to. Uh, to prepare and then we'll begin today's class. Father, we pray that you might continue to work in our hearts and souls and minds, that the um, Holy Spirit may enlighten, may clear to us your truth, that you might be glorified by the things we say, think, and do. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah, last week, I think I finished up with this uh, question of why. We said we were looking for the reason or results, right? Well, you know, the occasion, the circumstances, because of why it was written. And we said, uh, we saw that there was one of the reasons was the, the Antichrist. They were infiltrating inside the church. Uh, and that was in First uh, John 2, 18, 22. And then the second reason was to encourage them to um, to have their joy complete. Uh, we, we say, well, joy, that doesn't make them happy. No, it has to do with some method of contentment. And uh, it is not, it, it is a, a gift of God. It's something that we receive when we are obedient to his word. And we see that in John, uh, it actually talks about this idea of obedience. Uh, and then we have... Uh, to avoid <laughs> deception. That was the third thing. Uh, that, that we do not, first of all, do not deny that we sin. That we have sin. Uh, so the uh, necessity of confession uh, to regain fellowship. And then live as children of light and love one another. Those were the things we said uh, that kind of uh, uh, describes what what God expects from us in this life. And that's what John has written for these three reasons. So that's why we have those three, uh, 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 what I'm gonna say, items uh, that are emphasized throughout the letter. Those three, those three purposes. And so like when we read it, we should be looking for how that, those fit in, in, in what we're talking about. Okay, so now, we're going to go to the next one, which is when. When we ask the question of when, uh, <clears throat> we ask uh, uh, when uh, when was it written? When was this script, this uh, letter written? Uh, and uh, we, if you look at the commentaries and everything, they are saying it's kind of later after A.D. seventy because A.D. seventy is when. When Rome is destroyed, and everything it looks like Paul John is writing as a as a as a pastor for different churches, and in this case, he's uh, sending this uh, this personal letter to uh, as John is writing. It doesn't doesn't give us uh, um, what I'm saying is that it should be looks like he has a pretty good idea of what's going on, uh, and that's why we said eighty eighty. Eighty ninety. That's after the Gospels, uh, after the Gospel of John, sometime, uh, and that's the best guess, I guess. Uh, not you know, it's not a big thing if we say, well, it was done in sixty or seven, but it, just to give it a time frame, we know it was written before the, the Book of Revelation. And the Book of Revelation is the last thing John writes when he's imprisoned and put into the Isle of Patmos. The other thing is when <clears throat> is the period of time. In other words, we're looking, when we study the scriptures, it's important to know about dispensations in the sense that we, if we don't, if we don't make that distinction, we can get confused of what's written down. Uh, so it, we're saying this is the dispensation of the church. This is written during the time of the church. After Jesus Christ has died, buried, resurrected, ascended, uh, and we're saying uh, it's after Pentecost. The church has already been for several years in existence. So this is the church age. <clears throat> and then see, we, we say that that's uh, 
uh, what time we're going to see things that have happened before, events that happened before, right? And some of these events, Jesus came in the flesh. That was mentioned by John himself. He says that Jesus came in the flesh in, in, uh, in chapter 1, verse 1 and 2 of uh, John. Uh, go here real quick. Uh, so it talks about the incarnate word. Uh, and he says uh, what, what was from the beginning, what we have heard and what we have seen with our own eyes. So it's an eyewitness of Jesus Christ. What we looked at and touched with our hands. Now, did all of us touch it with his hand, our hands? No. We're talking about somebody personal in the time after uh, G, uh, after that Jesus Christ, he says, concerning the word of life. And here we believe that's really speaking of uh, Jesus Christ. And, and the life was manifested. We have seen and testified and proclaimed to you the eternal life which is with the Father and uh, was manifested manifested to us and uh, and in here it kind of I think this uh, is the idea of uh, the transfer Mount of Transfiguration he saw Jesus Christ in his full what I'm gonna say up to the level of capability he saw Jesus Christ in his second coming when he's gonna come because Jesus a few days before tells him there's some of you that will see me in my coming in my glory so I think and that's when he's talking to Moses and Elijah so a lot of this is related to this but I want you to understand he's emphasizing not the experience but words the word of life what Jesus Christ said I think that's the em emphasis here so we say we know it ha happened before and then we see uh, the next thing that happens after this book is written we're going to see that it's the book of Revelation the book of Revelation is something that happens to Paul I mean to John he's taken to the Isle of Patmos and then he's given the new uh, the vision of Jesus Christ and all that. so this is uh, that comes afterwards so sometimes the before and after is important um, Paul makes a big deal of the before and after. He says, when, when was Abraham uh, uh, saved? You know, before circumcision or after circumcision? Or before the law or after the law? And then you know, he says, well, I don't know. A lot of people don't, can't put a little, just a little history line together. And see, you know, he says, 400 years before, you know, Abraham was saved. And then the law came with Moses. And they came out of Egypt and he got it in Mount Sinai. So sometimes those events are important to, in order to make sure that we understand what's being said at the time or what is, what is being written. In this case, it's uh, to some importance in the sense it's speaking of after Jesus Christ comes and before the book of Revelation. Uh, and like I said, much of this... I get from a, uh, you can get from a commentary, a good commentary that kind of gives you background, a good uh, Bible commentary you know, where it has notes, study, study Bible. Many of those, a lot of this can be gleaned from there. But it's, why is it there? It's not just there for decoration or just to add more ink to the paper. It's there to give you a context to go from uh, by. Now here we talk about uh, place, uh, and then we, we, we see the place, uh, we see to some extent the place of origin or, or places discussed in, in this letter. Uh, it probably, and again, uh, it's around uh, probably Ephesus based on historical tradition. They say that that's where he's writing this letter from, Ephesus. Most, most of these, 1st, 2nd, 3rd, John is written from, from Ephesus, um, and, uh, or at least around uh, Roman Asia. Uh, and then we talk about other places that are mentioned, not really, except, except when we talk about in the light, uh, in fellowship. I mean, it, it's a, when you talk about in darkness or in light, we, we see that there is a sphere, in other words, a, an influence. If you're in the light, then you will have fellowship when the blood of Christ washes us of our sins. So in that sense, we have some location. But when we talk about this, this is mainly the letter. It, the letter itself, where was it uh, uh, coming from and, uh, 
and then if there was any other place important in, in the discussion, and we don't see any other place there. Uh, and then we see measure of quantity. Uh, we see uh, measure of quantity, quality that is, quantity and quality. We talk about people, things, or subjects that occupy the majority of what's written. And here's how you know, I, it's important to know what John is writing about. You find out by how many times something is mentioned, right? In this case, Jesus Christ is mentioned eight times uh, in, in, in this letter. Uh, we see uh, in the first uh, in, in one three says uh, we see that we have seen and heard and we proclaim also to you that you too may have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship which with the Father and His Son Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is is in this letter several times. Uh, two one he says that he is our propitiation in 2-1, right? That Jesus Christ is a propitiation in His blood, right? And then we have 4-2, um, uh, I think, is another. And by this, by this, he says, uh, you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus Christ is not from God. And this is the spirit of an antichrist. Now, one of the things that can identify somebody who, in other words, there's going to be one antichrist coming. And that's discussed in the book of Revelation, an individual. But there's many antichrists. It's, this is one of the tests. Is If he's saying that Jesus Christ was not didn't come as God and became flesh. He says, that's not from God. And you have several cults that, that say that. Uh, you have the Jehovah Witnesses say, no, Jesus Christ didn't come uh, in the flesh. He's just an angel, and uh, uh, but he's not from uh, in that sense. So he, they, they have different ways of uh, either it talks about the person of Christ or his work. They'll go against that. In this case, if he says he wasn't from God, that's again, he's talking about who does he represent? Jesus constantly come, constantly stated, I came to do the Father's will. I came, to, you know, and the Father sent me. I tell you the things that, I, that the Father has shown me. So all of this, this relationship is something that if somebody speaks against, is an antichrist. Okay? So that's how you can recognize someone who's, and again, when I say antichrist, in First John, uh, and these places, it's talking about the one that's not in the place of Christ, but someone who's against the person of Christ, either his person or his work. That's in the Antichrist. Uh, when we talk about in the, in, the, in the book of Revelation, we'll find here's a, here's a person that not only is against him, but actually claims to be God. He goes and sits in the temple. Of God, so in that case, we can say He is the. He, he, would, he took it to the next level, not just against Christ, but go, took it up to the level of trying to take His place, and uh, and that's what we find. Uh, and uh, so we see here in love is mentioned twenty six times. So we know this this epistle has a lot to do with this idea of love. Now. Again, uh, you know, when we go through, what do we mean by love? And is this an emotion? Uh, you know, I, I, you know, somebody, or is it love for God? Is it love for one another, or is it? Uh, in, in each text, that's what you. Have, yeah, well, in each text, you gotta just uh, actually talk about. It. Is it love from God? Well, then. You, in the context, you'll find God mentioned, and he says to who? There's an object. Love always has, is a, is a, is a, is a, is a has an object and a subject, and then there's a transition going between those two, right? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So that's in John. 
He says, what the object is the world. Now, in this, in this epistle, he says, do not love the world. <laughs> so is he talking about the attraction that he looked down and saw... Uh, saw saw one of us and says, "Oh, I like the way they comb their hair, the way they brush their teeth, you know, and I know what they can do for me and all that." So a lot of times, that's the kind of love humans. If they can do something for me, I love you, right? <laughs> if he, when you stop doing things for me, then and you cost me, then not so much. Well, see here, God gave His Son to a world that didn't earn, deserve, wasn't beautiful in His eyes. They were his enemies, and yet he did the best for them. So again, the object, the main, the emphasis of this love has to do with the, with the, with the uh, subject, the one doing the loving, the integrity. That's the quality. That's why I said the high quality of this love. And that's where it's the same kind of thing that God says, okay, now, in order to show yourself one of my disciples, you got to love one another. In other words, treat the other person better than they earn or deserve. Regardless of who they are, you know, love your enemies. <coughs> so that's this this epistle writes a lot about love. So if you want to know about love, besides what Paul wrote in uh, and uh, in Corinthians uh, in chapter thirteen, First uh, Corinthians thirteen, that passage is a lot about information about love. So love is kind. Love is not vindictive. Not, love doesn't keep a long list of wrong. But here in this, John here has given us a, a, a lot of explanation. So that's what I'm saying. So whatever, whatever this letter is about, it's about this relationship between God and us. So we want to have fellowship with them. And then believe is there seven times. Uh, we see that. Uh, and then uh, <clears throat> the other thing, the most important topic or thing, Christians should not be deceived. Believe in Christ and live in God's moral light and with his love. In other words, that, if you looked at the, the, the message of the book, that's what you'll be looking at. You'll say, we, we shouldn't be deceived. But several times he said, don't be deceived. And then and believe in Christ. Now, when we say believe in Christ, that's salvation in order to start it off, the program. But also believe all the rest, everything else <laughs> that, 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 he, that he commands and says and he promises. Though that's the kind of thing, the, the level of love that we're supposed to have. See, later on, he'll, we'll see that love and obedience go together in his eyes. It's not one separate. He says, he who says he loves his brother, but hates his, <laughs> but says he loves God, but he hates his neighbor, he doesn't know God. How can he love someone that he doesn't see and he doesn't show his love for his brethren? So that that's what I want you to understand. This pat, all of this, we're going to be looking at these, remember, we looked at the whole book with all of these seven questions. And when we look at all that, then we have to go next step. He's going to say, okay, we already kind of get the whole context of the book. Now let's take a look at the two verses that we're going to be looking at. And remember, we have to remember what we saw in context, so that way when we take each one of these words, see how that fits in that, in that big context. Okay? So this is what we're going to do next. <coughs> So I, I just picked, uh, here's the key terms. I think I put all of the terms in here, and I, uh, you know, I skipped a couple of the definite articles and stuff like that, but I <coughs> wanted to, uh, let's go back to reading. Um, First John, what's, what's, the, what's the passage we're looking at? First John, one. Six and seven, right? So, okay, so we're going to start off with that. And then so here we got, and I mentioned last time that when we talk about if we say, so that's a condition. And, and, and we see that, that I, as I mentioned to you, and you saw that my, my little key, it says that if, it, if the next verb or the verb that it's attached to the if is a uh, subjunctive, we're, we're talking about a third class. No, that's just a, but the idea is that it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a tense of a probability. It says, 
In other words, if we say, in other words, we declare that uh, as, as one declare, we, in the sense, who's we in this, in this passage? Who's, who's we in this passage? All believers that he's well, who's who's writing? John and all believers. Okay, so is J John is important that's in there because if we're not. He's not saying if you guys, if you y'all, and then therefore it could be unbelievers over there. We means that he's him and a believer, so he's including himself, and it's important to understand we're talking about a believer here. <laughs> and he says, if we say. That we have fellowship. Now, here this word, uh, konania, fellowship, it's a sense of having fellowship with God. And, I, and why do I say it's with God? Because here we saw in verse 3, which is right a couple of verses before our, our passage, in the context it says, uh, What we have seen and we have heard, we have proclaimed also to you, and we have, uh, you too may have fellowship with us. Now, there's the we part, right? And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. So it could mean fellowship among each other, all of us, and our love and all that. But I think in the context, it seems to be speaking of with God. Okay? So you understand why I'm restricting this to... And that's why I said, we, when I gave you uh, the test, I just put simple the words. Here I'm adding a little bit because I want you to understand... That when you you can take any word and just translate it boom, one by one, but it means nothing. A word by itself doesn't mean anything unless you bring it in with the context. Okay, and so in this context, I think it's talking about fellowship with God. Okay, understanding my logic. Okay. Well, and what I'm saying here's here's fellowship with God. And we saw that in 1 John 1, 3. And I believe 6 and 7 is talking about this same fellowship. <laughs> Uh-oh, it jumped the page or something. What do you mean? I'm in right now fellowship, Konania. Yeah. Oh, well, I... I, I missed... Know. Yeah, I, I forgot to put oh, the okay. next column. <laughs> I, I, I see it here, but I didn't put it here. So, yeah. Okay, so we have that. And then we have these others. Uh, 1 Corinthians, yeah. there it is. Uh, is uh, one nine. This is uh, and I used eight and eight to ten to give, give me context here. It says, uh, "Who will also confirm to you to the end and blame us on the day uh, of uh, Jesus Christ? God is faithful through whom we have, well, through whom you were called into fellowship with the with His Son." Jesus Christ our Lord. Now we exalt you, brethren, and by the name of Jesus Christ, that you will all agree and that there be that there be no divisions among you, but that you're made complete in the same mind and the same judgment. That the way we we join together should be doctrinally straight. It uh, doesn't mean we're going to agree on every point of doctrine. I, I, I don't think that's what the, the Bible is saying. you got to have unity in if you don't think exactly the way I do, then you're really not a brother, <laughs> kind of a thing. No, it's it's saying that we should agree on the major things, uh, major especially with this idea of what love is and how we're to treat each other. So regardless, you might disagree, but not in the point of, of fighting and, and killing each other because you didn't believe in my pre-wrath rapture or something like that. So that kind of a thing. Uh, we have, um, and then we have, uh, and then he says we have. So that's the the sense uh, of echo, which to have. It says to have a personal and familiar relationship with someone. In other words, in this case, with him. Notice uh, the next word we're going to get to. We have, uh, and, uh, and this this gives me the object. Remember, I told you, atas with him. Him, again, not with us or with each other. It's with God. That's the, in the context. Okay? So that's how you can arrive to a conclusion based on the evidence in the scripture itself. And God says, notice with him. It's singular. It's not with 
all of us or with the church or something. It's all about with him. Okay? That makes sense? I hope it is. <laughs> okay. Okay. <clears throat> so now that that's we've got up to this point uh, that we have um, go back so so that we have fellowship with him so the ultimate goal is to maintain that fellowship with God he says if we say we have fellowship with him okay that's one that's a claim it isn't and we're going to see here it could not be uh, in, in some sense for some it's not true and it's not true we could say we have fellowship with him we say that and that's what's saying here and yet, uh, here's the person, this is what uh, the person is deceived. He's lying to himself because it says here, yet we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So that's the, the real reality. In other words, that, it, we could do this. We can say, but yet do this. If we're, if we're out of fellowship, we're not in fellowship with him, uh, uh, and we're going to lie. We're walking in darkness. And we're going to see darkness has to do with being blind, not being able to see where we're going. Uh, we're not really in fellowship with God. Darkness is equated with that, if I were to take that that way. Okay. <clears throat> and then, um, so here, when we talk about uh, walking, is he talking about little walking? You know, walking, using our feet. No, right. Day-to-day right. day -day living. Yeah. It's, it's how we live, exactly. So to walk, it's a behavior. To live or behave in a specified manner, right? Uh, and yet walk means walking in darkness, hate his brothers. Also, we will see that, for example, in 1 John 1, uh, uh, see, 1, 6. So this is, this is what we do when we're walking in darkness. Uh, several places it talks about this hating of his brother. First John 2, 2 uh, chapter 2, verse 9, he says, The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in darkness until now. In other words, that's your location. That's in your position. And it says, uh, and then talks, keeps on, 2.11 goes on to say, but the one who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in the darkness. So that's exactly what the phrase or the idea that we're looking at in verse 6, right? The same idea of walking in darkness. It says, and does not know he is going where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So you see how that, that fits? And then we have uh, 3.13. He says, do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. Okay, now that's the same. Okay, here it is. Verse, um, uh, chapter 3, verse 15 of First John. It says, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding. Now the key part of there doesn't have eternal life abiding. means living. He's not living out the way eternal life is supposed to work. Follow him saying it's not saying he doesn't have eternal life. It doesn't say that. It says he's not abiding. He's not not utilizing that, uh, uh, and, and that's the that's a big difference. Okay. So now we uh, hopefully you, you can see that this idea that, um, that, that the idea of walking in darkness has to do with being out of fellowship, being hateful, not not obeying God's commands in that sense. And this is just one item of all of the things that God commands us. But one, if you remember how uh, this commandment, uh, when, when Jesus is asked, what is the greatest commandment? Love your, uh, it says, love God with all your heart and all your soul and your mind. And the second is, love your neighbor as yourself. So in that sense, he says, on these two, all of the law is found, okay? In the same, same kind of sense, in the New Testament, <laughs> The law that Jesus Christ is saying, it says you have to love one, your brother as I have loved you. So that sense, it's kind of like 
will, will you steal from your brother? <laughs> will you steal? Will, will you hate the person that you're supposed to love? So you follow what I'm saying? It's it's kind of encapsulating all of our our rules, all the things that God does command us. It's kind of in a nugget, uh, and that's why he brings this up. John is making a big point of love. Remember, I told you this whole epistle is talking about love. It's kind of just uh, encapsulating all the rules that we are supposed to obey. Okay. <laughs> so then we have. Uh, so that's where we're walking, and then in darkness, we said this is this causes blindness. We just read that. Right, uh, and deceiving us, living in a lie—all of those things have to uh, have the same idea. And notice what it says: uh, Yet we walk in darkness; we lie and do not practice the truth. Okay, so we're not putting to the to the rubber, uh, to the road, uh, what God is commanding us. Okay, so that's verse six, and that's where we say, uh, and then we we understand. Men love darkness uh, rather than light, right? In John, uh, uh, First John, or in J yeah, John chapter. Uh, if you look at the at the, at the at John itself, one to five. Let's go there. One four to five. It talks about. Uh, it says, "In him was life, and the life was the light of men." And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So what happened? It's talking about Jesus Christ coming into the world. He's displaying, right? That's what light does. It basically, what, what's the difference between light and darkness? Is light, is light. You know what darkness is? It's the absence of light. Absence of light. Right? <laughs> so <laughs> that's... That's the key, and that's why we see in the book of Genesis, it talks about how he says that he separated the light from the darkness. Now, light is there, darkness doesn't have, you don't have light in the, the darkness is not going to comprehend it. And when we say comprehend it, the idea could be two things. One, doesn't understand, or the other is that it can't defeat it in that sense. And that's what Jesus Christ, both things are kind of true for him. And then we say, uh, when we look at uh, men love darkness, right? We see uh, John. Uh, I think it's John 3, 18. It says, He who believes in me is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment. Notice now, he, he kind of brings in this idea of this. The light has come into the world. Who's come into the world? Jesus, Jesus Christ, right? <laughs> and men love darkness rather than light. They'd rather stay away from them. They, and then he says, he says, love darkness rather than light. Their deeds are, in other words, they, men love darkness rather than light for, this is why, because their deeds are evil. A lot of people don't come to salvation, don't come to the Lord. Why? Because they rather keep on doing what they like doing in their own sin. So that's that's kind of the judgment. He says, you, you don't want to put down and say, I'm accepting uh, Christ as my Savior. Then that's the problem. Yes, go ahead. Also, another thing, if, if there's a group of co-workers or something or group standing around, and someone that walks in the room that's a Christian and they know it, yeah. all of a sudden, you know, their language changes. Yeah. And that's a good thing. Jokes. Yeah. I, I remember I used to hang out with friends before I was an unbeliever. I was 28 years old. So I got used to people talking. And, but I can remember coming, knocking on the door of a friend of mine, and then next thing I whoosh, 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 whoosh. They're putting away the marijuana and, <laughs> and they're putting it all away. We, and I used to say, I was always embarrassed because I'm nobody. I mean, what are you doing that for? It was just that I think they were they saw the difference. And, yeah. and I think that's, yeah. and that's okay. <clears throat> so we see here, and then this idea that those that walk in this darkness, you know, don't practice the truth, right? Uh, but notice what it says, the lie. It says right here, the word here is uh, 
Pseudomai, uh, uh, okay. which here it says to lie, to deceive, to tell untruth. Pretend with the intent of deceiving, to deceive ourselves and being deceived. Now, that, that, that whole idea is also in this letter. <laughs> this idea that people are deceived. Uh, the truth is there, and the book of Romans kind of brings out the idea that, that no man has an excuse, but he says because of what God has already put into them. It's all right, and they suppress the truth. And this is what, what a person does. You suppress the truth or deny the truth. Eventually you can die to the point where you're self-deceived. And that's what we're, we're having here. And uh, we saw uh, verse 6, he says, uh, we lie and do not practice the truth, so we're lying. And then, uh, uh, and then it says, uh, uh, let's see, I have uh, 221 is another passage that, uh, in First John. He says, I have not written to you because you do not know the truth. Now he's talking about to, uh, to believers here. But because you do know the truth. But because you know it and because no lie is of the truth. So they, they recognize this. This is in, uh, a certain group of believers. We're going to see fathers. Uh, 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 and, then, and then we also have uh, the, the newborns and then the ones that are intermediate. Uh, that they have different in this case I think this passage is let me see uh, yeah it's a, but you have the anointing from the Holy One and all, you all know I have not written to you because you do not know so here it's talking about a certain group of believers and then we have uh, uh, 27 so here talking about this idea as for you the anointing you've received from him abides in you in other words this you're being obedient you're the one that's in the light you he's talking to this group and it says and you have no need of anyone to teach you but as his anointing teaches you about all things and it and is true and is not a lie and just as it has taught you you abide in him in other words this idea you're learning you've gotten to this point where you're you're abiding meaning you're abiding in the light the, you're you're maintaining fellowship and that's why i want you to see this abiding has that that a connotation and so then we go to the next word uh, uh, well, well, the next word has to do with do not. We, we saw that they're not, they're not obeying, uh, do not practicing the truth. He says they're not uh, doing it. He says ver the verb here has to do with uh, the sense to do in a manner, to behave in a certain manner, show a certain behavior or attribute, conduct uh, yourself. Now the idea of practice, we'll see that, and we already saw this word here in uh, first uh, in. First John 1, 6 and 7. Now we can just take a look at First John uh, 2, 29. He says, if you know he is if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who also practices righteousness is born of him. I want you to Listen to those words. It's talking about who practices, right? In other words, who actually goes on and, 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 and does the right thing is born of him. But what about somebody who isn't practicing? Does that mean he's not born of him? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. See, I want you. To, that's a good point. See, when we look at the scripture, we can't say the opposite is is true. Or untrue. You follow what I'm saying? That says, okay, if you don't practice, then you're probably not born. And that's how many people have interpreted this passage, this verse. You follow what I'm saying? Somebody who practices or continually sins, they don't, they're not born again. No, that's not true. Okay? And that's not true. Uh, the passage doesn't say that. It says that if you practice, you don't, you are. Okay? Right? 
So all it is giving us a positive, but it doesn't give us the, the negative. We can't use that. Uh, and, uh, okay, and then... What's see. that Greek word? The Greek word is uh, peo. Pe -o. Yeah, so to do, to make. Okay, first person plural, you guys. Y'all. Yeah. <laughs> it's basically what it's saying here. Y'all. That's the corner of Greek, y'all. Y'all, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and and, uh, and, and then we can see the same idea on John. John? Oh, no, it's not Jim. John. Uh, John 3. 3 20 to 21. Yeah. John 3 20 to 21. What does it say? Okay, that's where I'm going right now. I gotta figure out. Okay, in verse uh, 20 it says, For everyone who does evil hates the light. Doesn't obey the light, doesn't want to be in the light, right? And does not come to the light, for the fear of his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices, now again, the other guys are not practicing truth. Here's somebody who is practicing. But he who practices the truth comes to the light, so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. So that's the difference uh, of a person who's abiding and who is not. Somebody who's abiding is walking in the light, being obedient, and, uh, and wants the Lord to, to, to recognize and see what he's doing. He's not afraid of that. But someone who's not, they don't want They stay away from light. They don't want him to, to see anything they're doing. Okay? So that's, uh, that's the idea. So now we, we saw, well, I think we've gotten verse... Verse 6 kind of taken care of. Let's go to verse 7. Now this is uh, the second half. He says, but if we walk in the light as he himself is the light. Okay, so now it's the condition positive. Yes, this, if this is true. Then we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all, all sin. So let's go through those. Um, <clears throat> So we have, uh, we, we see this idea of aletheia, uh, uh, that's truth. That's, uh, it says, uh, but if we walk in the light, so see in the light. Oh, no, no I, I, I'm sorry. That was verse, that's in verse 6. Verse 6, we lie and do not practice. We're not doing this. Another person that's, that says one thing, but he actually walks in darkness, is not practicing the truth. So he's not practicing the Christian way of life. He's not practicing or utilizing uh, what God has, has provided, his rules and his way of, of, of that he wants us to, to live and conform to his requirements. Uh, and we see here is uh, in John 3.21. He says, but he who practices the truth comes to the light and his deeds may be manifested. So we saw that. And then we see sanctified by the truth. Jesus talking about his disciples. Now remember, he's been with them for uh, uh, at least three years when he writes this. Uh, I'm sorry, 17. This is toward the end of the gospel. And now he's talking about, to the Father, he's talking about his disciples. He says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So now we can kind of get the idea. Before when we say, when we talk about truth, we're talking about something that's true because it's reality. It meets reality. And, that, and that's where he says, your word, the Bible, the word of God, in a sense, is truth. And you sent me into the world, and I also have sent them into the world. So I, I, I've already told them what they're going to be doing. For the, for their sake, I sanctify myself. In other words, I set myself apart. I'm going to do this going to the cross, right? This is all part of what it, And that they themselves may also be sanctified in the truth. In other words, that they too may come to that uh, sanctification by means of, of what he's taught them in truth. I do not ask on the behalf of these alone, but also, now here's where it opens it up to the world, to all of us, to us today. It says, but I also, uh, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their, what? 
actions, through their practices, through their words, what they teach. So that's why it's so important. The, the study of the Bible is so important because our way of life, of a Christian way of life, is really in, found in, in, in these directions in the Word of God. It says, and they, that they may all be one, in other words, that they all be one part of the body, even as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they may also be in us. Now, the, when we talk about this in and in, what are we talking about? Fellowship. That we be in the same uh, sphere of, uh, of, of the family, right? In a sense. So that the world may believe that you sent me. So all of this purpose uh, of why we're supposed to be in fellowship constantly with the Lord. So the world, the outside can observe and say, yeah, they're, they're part of uh, a family. I want to be part of that. I want to attract them that way. So uh, that's what we see here. Uh, all right, so we can be sanctified by the truth, and that's through the Word of God. And then we say, but, uh, here's where the contrast. So we said, so this is what, what these people say one thing, but actually walk in darkness, then I practice in truth, the truth that we're supposed to be. And it says, the, the, con the contrast here is, but if, now it's a condition, this is, uh, this is, this is the good thing. This is where we should be. The other side is, we don't want to be that. We don't want to be living a lie. We don't want to be in darkness. But in verse 6, 7, he says, No, in this case, this is, here is kind of probable. In other words, it says, here over here, if I say something, and you could say, anybody can say that, but actually walk in darkness, then this is, this is the case. This is the reality. In the case here, when we're talking about, but if we do walk in the light, right? So now here's where the case, that, the, the positive, this is where we should be. It says, it says, but if we walk, as we saw it, in the light, like we already talked about, walking in the light uh, in, the, in, uh, in the previous, uh, we're talking about walking in truth. Second uh, John 2, 4, let's go to Second John. Second John. One. <laughs> Notice here, he said, Second uh, John, verse uh, one, four to five. I was very glad to find some of your children walking in the truth. Now here, John is speaking of those in this church that they were being obedient. They're doing what's right, just as we have received commandments to do from the Father. Okay, so here it is. Uh, now I ask you, lady, in other words, he's, uh, not as though I were writing to you a new commandment, but the one which you have had from the beginning, and that we love one another. So in this case, it's not new because it's already been around for a while. <laughs> okay, it says from the time that he started this, this church and everything, they, they've got this. This is the commandment, just as the commandment that you have heard from the beginning. Uh, see, is that, this is the commandment, just as you've heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. In other words, you should practice it. You should walk in the light. You should. So all of this goes together. Okay. Okay, so there's the phos, uh, that's the, the phos, that's, what, that's the Greek word for light. Now again, it says, uh, this particle is just as, now it's compared, it says just as God walks in the light, you're to walk in the light, right? In that sense, he says, uh, uh, as he, now who's he in this case? Uh, who, who's he in this case? Yes. He? Who? Who is he? Jesus. God. Yeah. So it's Father, God, uh, both are both of them walking in the light. So. And it says. Um, it says the sphere dominated by righteousness, goodness, 
and knowledge of God. So if you walk in the light, these are the, the, ask, the characteristics you're going to have as you, as you walk in. You'll be not confused. You'll know where you're going. That's what a light does, right? If you're in a place where you got light, you know where, which direction you're going. Paul, I think John, uh, who is it? Uh, David, when he says, uh, your, your, your word is a lamp unto my feet. Right? In Psalm 1. Right? So it's my path. So he says, I know where I'm going and you, in my daily walk I can see where I'm going. So that's that's the idea. As he is in the light, so that's the idea. So, And then we see, uh, and then the verb there says, sense of equality, to have the quality of being. Uh, we're this is the, an actuality for us. And, and then what? what is it that we, an actuality, according to the next one? Oh, I put, uh, did I put Foss again? Yeah. The sphere dominated by righteousness, goodness, knowledge of God. Right? That's what we're talking about. And, ha and uh, in this case, to have a personal, in this case, have. So what is it talking about? We see that it has to have a, a relationship and notice what it says the kononia uh -oh. that same word again that we had yeah. before uh, so man okay I keep on okay there's the kononia 16 and then we have this this sense of fellowship. And there is, as I mentioned earlier, this is in uh, Koninia, right there. That's, oh, you're still. Yeah, right. Okay. That's the next. Yeah. So we have uh, uh, fellowship again. The word fellowship has to do what we saw earlier in verse three. Talk about fellowship with, not just with these other, but with God. Okay. And uh, so this is the same, the, the same idea here. I don't think Paul or, or John is changing. It's talking about fellowship again with God. And then notice it says one another. And then it's here, it's talking about reciprocal. That uh, we are, we have fellowship as, as a, uh, with God. Vertical, horizontal. Well, this, this is the vertical one. This is, in the context, it's the vertical one that's being talked about here. Uh, uh, <coughs> it's, uh, uh, so we have here, a little long, one another. Uh, so the one another is with God. God. In other words, we as a group, individual, we have fellowship with, with God. Because okay. the whole, if we use that word over and over again, fellowship, 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 each one of them is indeed we have fellowship not mm -hmm. that we have fellowship with God so it's the, 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 I think it's uh, uh, in these two passages that's what it's talking about and notice uh, uh, here how is this accomplished All right we're going to see here we have this fellowship and here's the key the key for having this fellowship is, is this is this haima the blood uh, and notice what it says that the word, this blood isn't talking about the literal uh, streaming liquid that came out of Jesus Christ's body. If you look at just like it says the cross, it's talking about the work on the cross. The work on the cross. It's all, so it's really uh, that's that's the context. It's not just just because he bled and part of that blood, I drank it. <laughs> you know, remember when Jesus says, you know, he who drinks my blood or eats my flesh. And, you're not saying jump on me and grab the, start biting and start sucking. None of that. <laughs> it has to do uh, his what it resembles is this idea of a sacrificial lamb. Right? It gives up its life for to forgiveness of sin in the Old Testament. Here, Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God, take away the sins of the world, and that's the basis of forgiveness of sin. Uh, that's why it's it's so important here. Uh, <clears throat> Blood, the blood is taken into the holy of holy. Right, and one day a week, a year, and all of that, they was able to forgive the nation. And God says, "Okay, I'm going to give forgiveness on credit." And that's what had happened all through the Old Testament. God passed over those sins 
didn't get the full payment until Christ did it on the cross. So here, uh, that's what it's talking about. This, and notice it says, <clears throat> in the Haima, uh of Jesus means the Savior, right? That's uh, what that Jesus is. Christ means the Anointed One or Messiah, but Jesus, this has to do with Savior. Jesus, God, Savior. God's salvation. God's salvation. That says, and then it says His, so God's salvation that's provided through Jesus Christ. Uh, so we have, and notice what it does. What does the blood do? He says, uh, again, it was his son. So now it's Jesus Christ. Notice here it says, and uh, the, the word here, it says, to the sense of cleanses of evil, to purge of evil. Reality, the blood of Christ now cleanses us individually. Notice the verb that's present means that it's doing it on a regular basis. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not talking about the first time I believed in Jesus Christ, the blood of Christ. It, it does it then, but it does it now. It's continual, is what I'm saying. It's, and that's why it's used in a present tense, or else it should have sued. If it was just talking about a one time in the past kind of sense, then he would have said, he washed us. If that's what he's referring to. This seems to be speaking of how the blood continually uh, does this on a regular basis. Okay? Uh, and then what does it cleanse us of? Now notice what it says in the next verse. It says, and notice it's our. In other words, each one of uh, we. Again, who's he talking about? Who's our? Him and all the believers. Yeah, they're talking about you got to still talk about John. He's a believer. He also needs cleansing. So like Mary needed a Savior. Same. Every, every believer needs this uh, going on. Okay? So, and I like that word pause. Every time I see it, I just... I'm glad I can put my, my engineering mathematical hat on, on the side. Said, no, I, I don't have to take out a calculator and see how much... It's all, pass, all, an entire, yeah. the full quantity, the whole extent, complete. There's nothing uh, lacking oh. the, the, in a sense. So that's why we, we have this, uh, this that word yeah. is, is real important. And that, I, you know, you should take the, one day, go through pause the scripture and oh, every, pause. Pause means, pause means every, every all. No, it's all, basically all. All, all. And in the case, if there's a lot of individual things, then it's every. But if we say all, it means it's complete. So, and then when it comes to sins, right? Because it's uh, uh, of every harmatia, which is every sin, uh, and then of every. So that's why it's singular, genitive sin. Uh, every one of our sins. In other words, that's what. That's why we use every rather than all. We say every sin. Sense. We can see from all sin or uh, in this case because it's talking about seeing guilt, disobedience, lawlessness, unrighteousness all of those things we can see in verse 7 is it cleanses us from all sin and we see that same the same theme the same idea uh, when we go to uh, uh, 1 John uh, chapter 2 right because the one says he says, notice he says, I'm writing to you these things so that you do not sin. So it isn't that he says, oh, good. You, let's go do some more sins so that way you can get those cleansed. No, it's just don't, you know, don't do it. That's what he writes it for. And if anyone, if anyone sins, we, notice he doesn't say you guys, them people. He says, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is a propitiation for our sins. In other words, we, the reason that that we can be cleansed is because Jesus Christ provided this payment. Propitiation has to do with, here's anger, satisfaction, to, to keep God's wrath away, right? He took it away by, by this uh, action of Jesus Christ. And notice what it says, and it's, this is the part that people, that uh, Calvinists don't like. Because this, but he says, and not for ours only, us believers, of the whole world. So it's talking about this, this payment is, 
is 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 complete. There's nothing missed. I thought that only for the elect. Yep, that's what, well. Here's what they do. They'll take that, and for example, how they um, they'll take that the whole world. He says, well, all the whole world of all kinds of uh, of believers of all time, all the elect. He, they reduce it down to the elect only, and that's how when John is saying world, he really means the elect uh, in the world because it's all kinds of people. That, that's how that's how they get around it. But I, you know, I understand. I, I went to a school a seminary. That's that's what they taught me. So it's okay. I, I understand that point of view. So the thing that John three sixteen is that I'm talking about the elect. <laughs> yep, that too. Yep, they'll they'll, they'll reduce every one of those. I, uh, and I, see, you know, I've seen how they dance it. That's why I understand it, but uh, I don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> but here, I, you know, I take this literally the world. That means for those that accept Christ and those that didn't accept Christ, Jesus Christ made the full payment. So there, nobody can have an excuse that says, well, my sin was so great, so big, I killed so many people, and therefore God could never forget. No, God says, it's included. It's in there. It's in there. Okay, so that's, so uh, all unrighteousness. And that's, so we see that in different passages here, 212. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven uh, for his name's sake. It's his, the, the, the reason we can be forgiven, because of his name's sake, he says. Uh, and then fathers, because you know him and has come from the beginning. So here, little children, why? They're the more likely ones to, to, to produce so many sins and then not know what to do. Uh, in other words, that's, I think he says, it's already explains to these others that they're in fellowship and walking in fellowship. You notice what he said here to fathers, because you know him and have been from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the. I've written to you, children, because you know the father, because you do have a relationship. Okay, I've written to you, fathers, because you know him and has, who has, been from the beginning. And I have written to you, young men. Now there is the intermediate people. Yeah, uh, because you are strong and the word of God abides uh, in you and you have overcome the evil one. So how they overcome? It isn't that, yeah, they gotten to the point where they don't sin no more. Uh, I don't think that's that. I think it's because they know how, what to do. And it's the same same thing like with uh, David, for example, when, when, when they say, well, David is a man after my own heart. I say, well, hold on, God. How, how do you do that? This guy was a murderer. He killed Uriah. He, he committed adultery. Murdered. Because he knew how to respond. He, right away when God told him, you're on the carpet, he says, because I've sinned against you and you alone. It's okay. You're not going to die. But uh, the sword will not leave your house. You're going to get disciplined for it. But uh, don't worry. I'm not going to take... Because according to the law, he should have been killed. According to the law, it, it, but here, because he knew what to do, he right away ran to the Lord and had forgiveness. And then he says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, he would not have heard me. In other words, his prayer is going to be hindered if he maintains sin unconfessed. Okay? But he understood that. Uh, so... His immediate ascent to when Nathan confronted him. Yes, and that's and that's what he not like Saul. Saul said, "Oh, God doesn't want. I'm gonna go talk to this uh, woman and get her to talk to Samuel. See if he can talk to God for me." <laughs> and uh, you know, st instead of just saying, "Lord, I failed. I did wrong. You know, forgive me." Nope. <clears throat> so. Let me see what time is it we got. Okay. Yeah, I think it's a quitting time. So I don't want to go into the next section until next week. Uh, and uh, I'm glad to, I think we'll stop here. Uh, let us pray. Make sure that we're in fellowship and then we come back. Father, we give you thanks for this time you've uh, given us uh, to peer into your word. We pray that you might continue to work in our heart and mind. Make clear to us your truth so we're going to be obedient as you want us to be, Father. May we walk in the light as you are in the light. 
that we do have fellowship with one another. Father, we pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ. And we pray that as we go to our different places and going back home, or wherever we have to leave to, Father, that you might protect us, give us guidance, so that uh, we'll, once again we can come together and be able to study your word, and you may be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen.